Uh, well, thank you, uh, Susan, and, to, and thank you to your organisation for organising uh, today's event, but also uh, this series. Can I also acknowledge uh, the Lord Mayor, the Right Honourable Martin Hazy, uh, distinguished guests, particularly sponsors. I'm very pleased to see uh, my former employer, Deloitte, here uh, in force, and uh, it's terrific to have uh, a national leader, not just from that firm, but also in his uh, field of expertise, David Redhill, who's been nationally recognised as a leading marketer in, uh, in Australia. Transport infrastructure is something which is getting a lot of focus at the moment, uh, which is a terrific thing for South Australia. It's something that's incredibly important for our capital city, Adelaide. Adelaide's currently being lauded as either one of uh, the world's top 10 cities to visit, or as one of the world's smart cities, or as one of the world's most livable cities. And these recognitions, I think, are parts of our collective effort as a community in recent years to change both the built form, but also the culture uh, of Adelaide. And with a population of 1.2 million people, Adelaide has all of the benefits, but few of the stresses of a larger city. But for Adelaide to continue succeeding on the global stage, we need to do things a lot more cleverly and certainly a lot more efficiently than we have in the past. And we need to avoid some of the pitfalls that some of our uh, larger counterparts interstate uh, have had to encounter. Adelaide certainly is a car dominant city. Our use of public transport is low by Australian and certainly by international standards. Weekday travel speeds for cars and trucks have reduced by more than 8% in the last 10 years. But the number of vehicles has increased by over 20% in the same period. This means that our fleet is fast approaching the capacity of our road network to accommodate them. We certainly need to encourage more mode shift uh, from private vehicle transport to public transport. And we certainly need to make sure that our road networks function more efficiently. And if we don't achieve these two aims, then we will be confronted with the same need uh, to replicate our road networks and invest many billions of dollars in the same way that both Sydney and Melbourne have had to do in the past 30 years. Using our existing infrastructure more cleverly and encouraging mode shift onto public transport are both imperatives which are getting support at all levels of government, and that is incredibly important. An Infrastructure Australia report released earlier this year highlighted the economic imperatives of fixing our road and transport networks. If we don't take any action, travel times in Adelaide are estimated to increase by at least 20% in the near future with many trips on key arterial routes estimated to more than double uh, in time. And the cost delays on, public, uh, on Adelaide's transport networks will increase from around $1 billion each year today to over $4 billion over the next 15 years. And while, while I'm incredibly pleased that we're funding major north-south corridor projects like the Darlington project, the Torrance to Torrance project and the Northern Connector project, and that we're continuing our investments in public transport infrastructure, uh, such as the Oban City Access Project uh, and getting back on with the electrification of the Gawler Line, using technology and smarter infrastructure to maximise road network efficiency and encourage more people onto public transport is just as critical. And this is where intelligent infrastructure becomes so important. And central to the subject of intelligent infrastructure we're discussing today is the field of intelligent transport systems. Intelligent transport systems, or ITS as they're called, involve technologies applied to transport systems to transfer information between infrastructure and users of infrastructure, or between transport systems. ITS helps more efficient management and greater use of our transport networks. We know ITS has enormous potential to deliver safer, more efficient and more environmentally friendly uh, transport solutions into the future. And here in South Australia in recent years, we've gradually seen uh, ITS become an integral part of our transport networks. We've started from traffic induction loops, satellite navigation systems and analogue video monitoring of parts of our network. And we're now using sophisticated digital video detection 
Bluetooth detection, variable speed signs, dynamic traffic light sequencing, and automatic number plate recognition. There was one I didn't mention there that the department provided me, of course, and that's speed cameras. We see today ITS in practice at our state-of-the-art traffic management centre, which manages what we can proudly say is one of the most sophisticated traffic signal systems in the world. We automate and remotely control uh, road signs, such as the variable speed signs and variable messaging boards that you see on our major arterial roads. And we have automatic vehicle and incident detection on major corridors, uh, such as on the southeastern freeway in the Heysen tunnels. But there is much more to do. And data is central to our efforts at successfully expanding intelligent transport systems here in Adelaide. We're seeing the opportunities of capturing data and immediately providing it to transport network users. The Traffic SA website relies on over 300 Bluetooth detection devices that track Bluetooth systems in vehicles passing data points. This gives us unparalleled real-time accuracy in travel times for road users. It's a system which gives us about 15% penetration of the vehicle fleet using our road networks at any one time. And it is a much higher penetration than other states' approaches. Other states are either using mobile phone triangulation technology or they're using Google's estimates based on location services, uh, which are averaged and infrequently updated. Indeed, there's one uh, state uh, which my department urges me to keep uh, confidential, who paid a very significant amount of money to a uh, satellite navigation provider and their penetration of the vehicle fleet, I think, is less than 1%. And our Bluetooth detection gives us, for a very uh, reasonable cost, invaluable data on the traffic habits across our road network, allowing us to better plan and manage both roads and the traffic on them. And we've commenced rolling out those variable messaging signs across the state, providing motorists and freight operators real-time data on congestion and heavy traffic flows, allowing them to choose the fastest route based on this Bluetooth data. Real-time data also gives our public transport patrons accurate information on the performance of services across the network. And while we're currently receiving and publishing this data, allowing road users and public transport patrons uh, to uh, analyse it and make their own uh, travel choices, the ability for this data to be pushed back towards users uh, to allow them to make decisions while they're on the move is truly exciting. Smartphones are making this possible now, but vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle and vehicle-to-infrastructure communications will take the use of this data to another far more productive level. And this is why we're so excited, and as South Australians, rightly proud, uh, of a South Australian company, Coda Wireless's achievements on the global stage. They are global leaders in V2X communications technologies. And they're not only working with global uh, automotive industry players like General Motors uh, and Siemens, uh, who are here today, uh, but also working with governments around Australia about how to equip transport infrastructure so that it can more efficiently manage traffic. We're equipping, we, we are equipping in South Australia our major road projects with optical fibre communications at each stage that is constructed. And this communications backbone, a backbone provides for the vital managed motorways technology which we are currently rolling out, as well as support for future ITS developments uh, as and when they occur in the future. Eventually this will allow connected vehicles to interact with the traffic network uh, particularly regarding congestion, speed limits and road condition information. And we'll continue to look at expanding the use of ITS technology in our transport network in areas such as ramp metering, lane use management and further rollouts of variable speed limits and incident detection. Because there is a huge opportunity to sweat the infrastructure that we already have without always having to expand, duplicate or extend our networks. And this is where autonomous vehicles make a contribution as well. When the Premier announced the government's plans to legislate for driverless cars, our plans were quickly compared to a Jetsons make-believe scenario. The fact is that most major car companies and many technology companies are well advanced in the development of autonomous vehicles and many cars on the market already have some uh, autonomous functions included. 
and in Australia, many of them disabled. And as we saw on the Southern Expressway a couple of weeks ago, these cars are coming to our roads very quickly. And as I experienced uh, uh, the day before, uh, there's still some uh, room for the community's adaption to those technologies as well. We know that the road safety benefits of autonomous technologies will be incredibly important uh, and significant to the community. Uh, we estimate that uh, drivers are responsible for up to 90% of accidents on our roads, and there's obviously the ability to significantly reduce that. And of course, we're very, very supportive and keen on the greater mobility and freedom it'll give uh, those members of our communities uh, who, can't, who currently can't uh, drive themselves around uh, and access services. And of course, we're interested in helping people become more productive on their journeys uh, when they're in their vehicles. But aside from all of these benefits of autonomous vehicles, I'm very keen on its capacity to reduce congestion. Autonomous vehicles will be able to run substantially closer together, reducing, uh, reacting near instantly to traffic around them. This means running a much higher number of cars on the same amount of road space. Global estimates range between running two to five times the number of cars on our roads once this technology is completely and successfully deployed. The avoided road investment in the future is likely to total billions that can either be left with taxpayers uh, for their use uh, or with government for investment in other productive purposes. And while public transport will always be more effective at reducing congestion, with buses accommodating up to 70 pa passengers while accommodating the road space of three to four cars and trams and trains exponentially more, more efficient uh, than both cars and buses, there is a strong role for autonomous vehicles to make a substantial contribution to reducing congestion. Recognising this is why South Australia is the first state to draft laws allowing autonomous vehicles to be trialled on our roads. It's why South Australia was the first state to host those on-road trials of autonomous vehicles in the Southern Hemisphere and why we took the lead in bringing experts from around the world and hosted the first ever driverless car conference in Australia. These efforts are also about lifting the gaze of our community and regulators to the benefits of these technologies. We don't expect that uh, car companies or technology companies are suddenly going to uh, pick up and decamp uh, their efforts uh, that they are part way through internationally. But what we hope we can do is convince the community, convince the Commonwealth, convince other states that this is worthy of national attention and effort in order to accelerate how quickly this technology can be deployed on our roads. But we still have a fair way to go, whether it's with state legislation, whether it's with federal uh, legislation, uh, with uh, issues such as Australian design rules. And here in South Australia, we've also taken the opportunity to try and take a more progressive and adaptive approach to how we manage our transport networks. We're reviewing our legislation more generally uh, in order to be agile to accept these technologies not just the ones which we can see before us, but to try and accommodate those uh, which we haven't yet encountered. Our Motor Vehicles Act was written when the FB Holden was first released onto the market in 1959, and the Road Traffic Act two years later. The time for reform is here. And I'm also keen to publicise that we're conducting a root and branch review of our taxi and chauffeur vehicle industry we want better services, more closely aligned with the public's expectations, because we're not there. And despite what you may hear from some people, we are a very firm believer in competition, and we see a much larger role for innovation and technology in this area. And just like the other emerging technology providers, uh, we hope uh, that one of your guests here today uh, can assist South Australia uh, in this review. So in closing, there are genuinely exciting opportunities on the horizon. Smarter infrastructure and the ongoing adoption of intelligent transport systems to better manage our infrastructure mean that we'll be providing a better service more efficiently and more cost effectively than we could have conceived of even 10 years ago. And in 10 years time, the landscape will be vastly different again. That's why the imperative to adopt, to adapt is upon us. 
And I thank you for your interest and your efforts in helping make this happen.